This information is brought to you by Charles Sturt University. Um, so the title was Leadership, What Does It Mean? How It's Evidenced Advocacy and Lobbying. But I, I would, I, I'm going to run through these things. So just a, a quick bit of a disclaimer. Um, some comments on why regional matters. And I suppose that's, um, that's trying to set the basis of why, you know, why talk about any of this. And that, that will touch on some of the things that we've had already this morning. And then I want to talk about leadership for regional Australia and about getting the message across. And at, at the end, I'll give some examples of some of the things that... Uh, have happened at CSU around the social media space, both from the university and from students, which I think are kind of interesting examples. So uh, just first I thought I'd start with a disclaimer because uh, we had a discussion at our academic senate uh, a couple of weeks ago about self-plagiarism. So, <laughs> right? No, seriously, so, so now plagiarism includes reusing your own material without attribution. So. <laughs> Just, I, I have to acknowledge that at least one of the slides here has been used at a previous SEGRA conference, um, and I'll, I'll give a bottle of CSU wine to anyone who can tell me which one it is. Um, but I, I got off a plane from South Africa on Sunday night, so I'm still a wee bit jet-lagged, and uh, one of my favourite comedians, Stephen Wright, has this lovely line, uh, right now I'm having amnesia and deja vu at the same time. I, I think I've forgotten this before. It seems kind of apt to me this morning. Um, so I thought I'd start with, uh, you know, why does regional matter? And we've, you know, we've heard a lot of this this morning, but... Uh, and these things have been touched on, but you know, regional it has a particular meaning in Australia, it seems. It means different things in Europe, and we heard some of this in uh, Daryl and, and Christian's discussions. So in Europe, you talk about the London or the Paris region. In Australia, it tends uh, often to be used in a slightly pejorative sense in, in thinking about regions as deficit, which I, is not how I think about it. Um, the other thing I thought's worth saying is it's been interesting to me that regional is a bit of a variable concept depending on where you stand. And when we've had discussions about regional loading for universities, for instance, it turns out that all universities are regional, just some are more regional than others. Um, so I think uh, regional starts about halfway between you and the capital CBD. So when I was in Rocky, region started in about Bundaberg. Um, for us in Bathurst, it starts at the Blue Mountains, but I was quite amused to note that the New South Wales Regional Transport Plan says that New South Wales' premier regional city is Parramatta. Which, <laughs> you know, which looks hilarious when you're, when you're on this side of the Blue Mountains. Um, and the other thing is the bush. No one lives in the bush, right? The bush is always about 100 kilometres further from where you are. So for us, it's uh, some way halfway between Orange and Dubbo. Um, in Dubbo, it would be somewhere out towards Wilcannia, and in Wilcannia, it's somewhere out towards Alice. So you know, all these things are kind of variable concepts that we use depending on where we are. Um, I thought I'd put this one in. I, I like this. So as I said, for me, you know, I've only lived in regional Australia since I've been here for 20 years, and it's not a pejorative term. Uh, you know, I think regional Australia is fantastic. This is a quote I picked up in Canada from a, a painter who actually had a school of painting called regionalism, and said, provincialism is what people do when they live as they think out there in the sticks, and they try to imitate what they think is hip in the big centres. Regionalism is simply what people do when they are at ease with themselves in their own environment. And I think that's a really nice way to put it. You know, it speaks to that love of country that we heard from Aunty Gloria this morning. It speaks to some of the things that Daryl was saying about really valuing the places you're in and thinking about that. And I think it also speaks to the things that came out through the panel discussion. So, you know, I like that idea that, that regionalism is about very, feeling very comfortable where you are and, and, you know, feeling very good about it. Um, last month or so, I've done quite a bit of international travel. I've been to South Africa twice, as it happens. Uh, and I'm also a member of the thing called the Tawa Network Steering Committee, which is a group of universities devoted to civic engagement. And a very strong theme out of all of those discussions was this concern for a protection of the regional voice. And so, you know, different sense of regional if you're thinking about Africa, but the African universities are very worried about being overrun by America, um, particularly in the digital world, as if education kind of gets flattened. And, uh, you know, the same thing with the Tawa network. There was this strong sense that they want to retain that ability to engage with their communities and to have a real sense of local and sense of place. Um, and, and that sense of an authentic regional voice. So there's this kind of zeitgeist of worry about losing identity um, in a globalised world, which I think is very rational, actually. Um, and it, you know, it strikes me that there's a paper called Deep Capture by a couple of authors called Hansen and Yosifon who talk about the way that we are, our thinking and our behaviour is shaped by things that we don't understand, by our culture, by our upbringing, by our natures. Um, and so we're captured by our systems. And when you 
live in regional Australia recognise that many of the power and esteem structures that we have in society just automatically assume that the best thing is to move to a capital city. You know, scale seems to trump everything and, uh, and there's a kind of disdain for the local and the regional. And with all due respect to economists, and, uh, um, and I thought your presentation was great actually in, in putting a slightly different spin on this, but I, I know the Grattan Institute, there are a couple of reports that sort of bird up me a little bit. One was about regional investment and particularly I think did some very sloppy data analysis about regional universities to draw the wrong conclusions. <laughs> but also uh, th there was a, a one about cities as engines of prosperity and I was looking at this again last night and it's got in there this business about moving things to the CBD. You know the problem is that not everybody lives in the CBD because that's the most productive bit and if we could just gather everybody and kind of put them in a square mile of Sydney you would have this e economic powerhouse. And that's a, a pretty crappy picture that I took on the iPhone when I was down in Darling Harbour, but it, it really made me think that if you look at architecture, what is celebrated in architecture? You know, if you wind back, let's say, a thousand years or 1500 years in Europe, it was military things were celebrated. They built big castles for defence reasons. Then you moved on to the great cathedrals. Uh, you wind back to the Industrial Revolution and kind of civic architecture was the thing. And if you look at the old buildings in Sydney, you know, they're government buildings. But if you look at what the big buildings now, they're banks and they're consultants and uh, they are services firms. And that's lovely. Uh, banks are what? Great, you know. I have a mortgage now. And, <laughs> and, and con you know, consultants and, and all of those things are wonderful things. But it's not primary economic production. So I don't mean to say it's bad, but it's just interesting that if you look at is what is celebrated in the CBD, it's the kind of you know, tertiary production in some ways, it's the services industries. And we know how important that is to the economy, but still it makes you wonder then about localism and, uh, and about people's sense of place. Um, another bugbear of mine is global, you know, global research ranking. So much of the discussion about what we should be doing with universities and higher education comes back to we need X number of universities in the top Y pick your number, you know, we should have five in the top 20 or we should have 20 in the top 100 or whatever it is. No one usually is able to articulate what that means. I, I, sorry, they know what it meant. Well, you know, what, what, what would be the benefits of that apart from national bragging rights? And, and again, we've become kind of captured by that in terms of higher education policy. We, we're obsessed with whether we're competitive. It's only one measure of competitiveness and to climb up those rankings, mostly you need to do scientific research and mostly you need to do theoretical research and mostly you need to do research that's going to get you into science or nature. And it's good, you know, it's great stuff. It's brilliant research, but it's not local. And it's not, you know, it's not focused on local needs necessarily. Some of it is, but it's... And, and uh, this, this kind of rhetoric about international sport and, you know, you would only invest in gold medal, medal winners. Well, you know, if you think about an international sport comparison, Aussie rules is only played by Australia, but I don't think anybody's suggesting that we would stop playing Aussie rules because it's not an international sport. So, you know, you've got to think about those analogies. Uh, and the other thing there is, if you want to win at that game, well, you can't because, you know, if we were to invest three times as much in our university systems and claw our way up the ranking, somebody else would do the same thing. It's a, you know, it's an increasingly expensive game that no country can win. And I, I, so I think it's not the right way to set overall policy. All right, I'll stop ranting. Um, now, the, 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 you know, the Grattan Institute would probably say, well, that's lovely. You're the vice chancellor of a regional university. You're just special pleading because you want money for regional areas. And you know, even though it's not as economically efficient as putting it into the CBD of Sydney. Um, so just a reminder about some of the things. Uh, and we've heard some of these this morning. A third of Australians live outside greater capital city areas, 30% outside of major cities. Um, one thing I always really want to stress, and this is part of what I self-plagiarised from a previous SEGRA presentation. This isn't the slide though, so that won't get you the bottle of wine. Um, the population of regional Australia is not going backwards, because sometimes when we see stories, the relative lack of growth in regional Australia is kind of presented as an absolute lack of growth, and therefore we don't need to invest because the population is not growing. But it is, you know, it's growing quite strongly, just not as fast as the CBDs. Um, so anyway, I won't read those stats out. Um, we have very diverse economies in regional sectors. Uh, again, we've heard some of that this morning. Services, health, education, infrastructure. A uh, city like Bathurst is very fortunate to have a, a broad range of industries in it which support it very well, as a number of successful regional centres do. And tourism is very important too, so a little under half of the, the tourism revenue is coming from regional tourism. 
this has been mentioned as well, so I won't dwell on it too much, but it's a, Australia is a country of extremes. Uh, my quick Wikipedia fact check suggested we're actually top 20 for urbanisation, um, but bottom 10 for population density overall. So out of about 240 countries, we're right down the bottom in terms of average population density, and yet we are... We, we may be the most, the most urbanised developed country, we're certainly ahead of the US and Britain. So we've got this real paradox that we're you know, intensely concentrated and very, very sparse. And the reason I want to bring this in, and it comes back to this sort of narrative business about what's great about regional Australia is, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to get out of Britain, or my wife and I wanted to get out of Britain 20 odd years ago, is that the place was unlivable. It was choked with traffic, it was too expensive, you couldn't afford to buy a house. Um, you know, as we heard today, a major part of every day went in commuting. Um, and that's starting to happen to us now. And I, I don't, there was a story in the Sydney Morning Herald this morning about the uh, West Connect and you know, the fact that it's actually not going to fix the traffic. So before I did a PhD, I was a highways engineer. And I spent my days convincing local councils that it was okay to build more roads and more housing estates when it very obviously wasn't in Britain because the, the roads were absolutely choked. We're starting to see that in the capital cities now, and I think, therefore, we will see a swing back to regional centres because people will actually not be willing to put up with the lifestyle that we're getting in the capital cities. Uh, and, you know, speaking as a highways engineer, it's nice to see the stories coming out because I have tried to tell this to the political leaders uh, when they'll listen to me. You are not going to solve Sydney's traffic problem by building a bigger motorway into the middle of it. <laughs> right? That just puts more people in cars on the road. You, can, you solve the traffic problems by congestion charging and by having good public transport. Um, so I'm hoping that those are the agendas we're actually going to start looking at as a country. So, let's talk about leadership. Um, so just some thoughts. Uh, currently we're going through a change process in the university. We're doing a bit of a faculty restructure and we're also restructuring admin roles. And I think if you were to ask the National Tertiary Education Union whether I or any of my senior team should be talking about leadership, they'd say, don't listen to us. Um, so if anybody does want to come and hit me later on, uh, it's understandable. We are going through quite a bit of disruption, which is upsetting for people, and we're working through that as, as well as we can. But I suppose, you know, it's just amusing that uh, leadership is, is it's a journey, um, and it's, it's a, if you're trying to make change, it's, always, it's not always an easy journey. Um, so some other thoughts on leadership. I think it is a bit of a paradox. You know, in my heart of hearts, I don't think we should need leaders. Uh, I don't think we should really need vice chancellors in universities. I don't think we should need prime ministers, but we do. And uh, leaders that I've worked with have been very important to me. So, you know, it's paradoxical. In, in one sense, I think we shouldn't need to have official titles of leaders, but somehow as human beings, we do. And to those of us who the job falls, we have to do the best we can of it. Um, it is a shared journey. I think there's a, there's a quote from the West Wing, I believe, which is, you know, what do you call a leader when nobody follows a man going for a walk by himself? So, you know, it, it, it is a shared journey. Uh, it needs to be, or it's nothing at all. And I also think it's a shared responsibility. So, for me, I'm always keen to encourage distributed leadership and to acknowledge that it's not just about the Vice Chancellor or the CEO or the Prime Minister. What we actually need is people to feel that they have agency at all levels. And again, I think we've heard some wonderful stuff about that this morning. We need people to feel that they can make change and that they don't have to wait for the government to do it or the vice chancellor to do it. Um, so, you know, uh, roles with power and authority are very important, but they're not the end of leadership. We actually need everybody to feel they have a sense of agency. And I think part of what we should be doing as leaders is encouraging that sense of agency. Um, one thing I always say is that it's about showing reality and possibilities to others. So leadership is actually about it, showing people the world in a way that they hadn't previously seen it and encouraging them to think about it in a different way. Um, so, it, it, you know, I think storytelling is an important part of that because that's, that's what we respond to well as human beings. And, uh, you know, my kind of cynical quote at the bottom, uh, I always like to think about this, it's an Oscar Wilde quote, we're all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. So, you know, we're, we're all flawed human beings trying to make our best way in the world, but uh, we do have to have our sights on somewhere slightly better. Um, so what kinds of leadership do we need in regional Australia? Um, I think you know, it's very important not to fall into the deficit narrative. The way that regional Australia is often characterised from the cities is the handout mentality that all we're ever interested in is, is getting you know, support for things that are not economically sustainable. And I think this conference, you know, in all of its uh, variations, has been terrific in actually challenging that. 
and try to come up with very positive stories about how we find our way forward. And again, presentations this morning were great. So we don't need rescuing. We need policy settings that allow us to succeed. Um, it is challenging. Uh, if I think about even somewhere like Bathurst, is probably a more challenging environment, or the Central West Riverina is a more challenging environment to work in than, say, Townsville was. Townsville was 180,000 people, pretty isolated from other places, and the whole business community and leadership community was very tight, actually. You know, if you went to things, you saw the same people week after week, just about. There's a bit more work in these kinds of regions to actually stay connected. Um, so I think, you know, one of our jobs is actually to try and enhance that collaboration and make sure uh, we pull things together. And, and for well-intentioned reasons, there are a lot, a lot of actors in the space. There are universities, there's the RDAs, there's you know, SEGRA, um, there's local government bodies, there's state government, there's federal government. So one of the things I think we can do as a university is actually to help to join those things up as much as possible. But it's you know, something everybody needs to be mindful of. And of course, it's important to connect to uh, capital city decision makers as far as possible as well. Um, so advocacy and lobbying. Uh, my former boss, Sandra Harding, is the vice chancellor at James Cook University. He talked a lot about third party endorsement. And I think that's very important. In, in terms of pulling a coalition together and trying to make a case, me going and talking to the minister about something is one thing, but if you can actually get people who are not self-interested to go and say the same thing, then that's a much more powerful voice. And that's where you've got to put the work into the collaboration and the coherence, uh, finding somebody who's not self-interested to help promote the case. So to talk a bit about lobbying, I, you know, I mentioned storytelling. I think this is important, and again, perhaps it shouldn't be. You know, we, we like to talk about evidence-based policy making, and we'd like to imagine we're scientific, and uh, of course we're not. You know, we, we are swayed by stories. Uh, so from speaking as an academic, I think it's important that we do have sound, a sound evidence base for the things we're trying to push and the cases we're trying to make. But that by itself is not enough. You do need to weave that into a story and a narrative and be able to pitch it. Thank you. Um, and uh, it, and you, you, know, you need to situate that in something that's going to resonate. Um, so I think it's very important that we are telling stories about what we need from regional Australia in terms of what's good for the country, not just about what's good for us. Contextualising it, um, I've got the note there that anecdotes are important and it, it seems to me, particularly in the political arena, that anecdotes take on a life of their own, so you want to choose them carefully. But you know, a well-placed a well anecdote to sit around the facts and the evidence can be really very helpful. Um, so what are we trying to do in this space? And just quickly, uh, in the research space, for instance, one of the things we've tried to do is to move our research strategy into being very firmly focused about what's good for our regional communities. So if you wound back five or six years, uh, our research strategy was really about trying to be a bit better at the things we do. We're trying to situate that very firmly now in terms of what our regional communities need. And the reason for that is that that's a sustainable place to be, and it's a differentiated place for us to be, because we are here. We are here working with our local communities and nobody else is. So uh, we've, we've got what we call a research narrative. It's got six themes in it. I won't read through them all. They should make sense in terms of, I think, what's good for these communities. And part of the job that we're trying to pursue at the moment is to work with our local industries to articulate what we're doing in terms of that and the things that Michelle was talking about this morning in terms of Indigenous entrepreneurship are very firmly in that. They fit under that, uh, that fifth bullet point there about Indigenous research. You know, to me, that's absolutely part of what we need to be doing, which is encouraging our communities to improve. Um, just a note on risks for political lobbying. If you saw the story that Wollongong, well, we all got a going over from the New South Wales Audit Office, but it was, it was um, prompted by the amount that Wollongong had spent on dinners with uh, political parties. Um, it comes back to the values piece. You have got to be careful about how far you go in pursuing some of these agendas. So there are some risks in playing in the political space. Okay, so just to finish off then, uh, just some things about getting the message across. And uh, it's a challenge. Regional media isn't what it was for you know, all of the economic rationalist reasons. Things have tended to concentrate back to the cities. And the, re the real opportunity then, I think, is that um, now with social media and the internet, it's much easier for us to get our message out directly. So I just want to quickly give you a few examples of that. Um, first is Doctors for the Bush, which is a Facebook campaign which we've run to support our bid for a medical school. And has got about 50,000 likes on Facebook. 
That's been quite important for us walking the halls of Parliament House uh, because it has got people's attention. They've seen that. Um, so, you know, it's taken some organisation and it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a discussion site. Um, it's not just a promotion site, and I'll come back to that. But it, it, it's actually attracted quite a bit of discussion, and it's been a place that people have talked about the issues of, of regional health. Um, I like this one. I think uh, the supermarket's got to mention this morning. One of our vet science students who happened to come from a dairy farm uh, actually did a short video to counter the campaign that Coles had put out about their milk pricing. And that was quite actually instrumental in the fact that Coles got a ping from the ACCC and had to apologise and uh, put adverts up to retract what they'd said about milk production. So that's one of our students did that just because they were upset about it. So it kind of shows the power of social media and be able to, to reach those things. Um, and this is a, a nice one. This is one of our students who's done the Lego Farmer. Have, have people seen that on Facebook or Twitter? Yeah, have a look. It's, it's a lot of fun. So the, the Amy says she's done this because she loves macro photography and, uh, and also um, regional Australia. So she's used little Lego props to do a rolling series of stories about things. So the, the, the top one there, see if this works, that's when they had the Ag Summit in Canberra. And this one I like, this is the Denny Ute Muster with a, a little, <laughs> a little uh, uh, warmer on there with the stage behind. And this one down here is three big things you can do in terms of uh, global food shortages. So it's actually encouraging people to think about reducing food waste. Um, do have a look at the site, it's really nice. But I think it's a good example of where you can do something that's a bit of fun, um, but it gets a very serious message across and actually attracts people's attention. And that's got about 7,000 followers. Okay, so summary, quick summary. I think we've got a great story to tell from regional Australia um, and great stories to tell as well. So let's keep doing it and uh, hopefully that's about the right for time. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. I think we've got time for one question. Anyone have a question? Yes, in the front here, please. Um, look, one particular thing that springs to mind straight away is that Wagga, the committee for Wagga has had a young leaders program, young and not so young leaders program, which we've been involved with both in sponsoring and we've had people from the university go and talk to them. So I've done a couple of talks to the iterations of that. And again, I think it's a good example where you can get organisations working together to do that. So yeah, I think there are some good things happening in that space. Um, it, I, I think we've got to do more work in the indigenous space too. Um, and, and Michelle's work is a good example of, of trying to encourage that. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks.